Hi, this is Ridge Runner with Pine Home Primitives and welcoming you to our next video on outdoor cooking, specifically use of the Dutch oven in primitive circumstances. I will start out here by telling you I'm going to cheat because I don't have the fire going quite yet. Um, what we're going to start out with is going to, we're going to brown our meat in this cast iron skillet here and we're going to take it outside. And we're going to use the uh, exactly the way you would use it if you're in the woods and you didn't have access to charcoal. Now let me make a quick preface here. If you want to learn more about how to season and maintain a cast iron skillet and how to use the charcoal and, and, and pretty much in, in a bunch of other outdoor um, cooking methods, I recommend looking at Cave Cooking number, um, Volume 2 by Karen Hood. Uh, she did a wonderful job on all that and I'm not even going to attempt to, uh, to upstage that because you can't kill perfection. So let's uh, start out with doing this. We're going to have this, we've got this pot, this pan is starting to get heated pretty well. Um, you can hear it kind of going in there. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to check a little bit of water here and I'm going to show you something and see if it's, yep, that hot. All right, now, there's my meat. Where's the beef? Okay. Now I'm going to let this set for a couple of minutes here and uh, just get it so that what I'm doing is I'm searing in all of the good juices that make the meat what it is. And uh, from there, I will use my survival spatula to flip it. Notice the dangerous teeth and other things that make it a survival spatula. Just kidding. The point is, um, you want a nice long handle spatula. This one here has some uh, tenderizing implements and things on it so that you can do it. But you really don't need that. I got a couple of them. Um, you just, what you really want is a nice long handle spatula that will allow this meat to, you know, that will allow you to get in there without having to get your hands right into it. Now, this is a rather unique stove in that mm, that it smells good already. Honey, you like it medium rare, right? I'm going to try it real rare. <laughs> but, um, uh, so basically we're just going to season this with a couple of basic simple things. Salt, Italian seasonings, and pepper. Okay. One of the things that a lot of people don't really understand about seasoning food is the average person when they're grilling or they're cooking, they never use quite enough seasoning. And if you actually look at how they cook, if you're going to want to watch a cooking show, and you watch how much they put on, they don't start out with a little dash here and a little dash there of whatever it is. That you want to start out with a good amount. Because half the time, it goes into the rest of the food anyway. Now, I don't cook with a lot of salt, because many people don't like salt when they're cooking in their food or they wish the salt to taste. So I'll only put a little bit in here, and that's probably all the salt I'm going to put in the entire meal. And let's see if we can move this around a little bit here.
step, which you'll see pretty shortly, we're going to start with putting the putting it in the hot Dutch oven and getting the uh, getting everything ready to go. So, uh, Hi, this see you in a minute. Alexandre here to show you the basics of putting together the food in the Dutch oven. And he's got his fire going. He's already pan seared the uh, meat on each side. I've already pre-cut all the vegetables that are going to go into the roast. I'm going to pour them in. You want to have enough room on the sides so that it breathes. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to mix it all up together. So, you take a little bit of oil and you're going to put it in. You want to make sure there's a nice coating of all the vegetables. You're going to put some pepper. Because we love pepper. <laughs> just a little bit of salt, even though he put some salt. Just a little. We're going to put some of the seasoning. He didn't put a lot on the actual meat itself. We do need to get it on the vegetables. And you want to take your hands and you want to get it messy. You want to rub it around. Make sure it gets on all of them. Pick it up. Hmm. If I didn't know that was raw in the middle, I'd want to eat it right now. And then you're going to add a little bit of water for the bottom. Try not to get it all over the uh, vegetables, though, because you don't want to wash off that stuff. And then, make sure it's all nice, nice. There's room. The meat can be seen. And then you'll add your cover. And when the rich runner is ready, you can place it. And we will video it for you from there. <laughs> Hi. Over here we have what I call basic log cabin fire. A lot of Boy Scouts learn how to use it, learn how to make it. And uh, for some things it's not the best. But for when you want to make a lot of coals and you want to make a nice cooking fire, this is the way to make it. Okay. Um, what you want to start out with, and you didn't see this because I didn't start building, I, I already built it. But you can see down below here. If you want to pan over here, you can actually see this. Where I put a bed, uh, I put a bed of split wood. I split it with my knife right across the bottom there, and then using thumb-sized twigs and, and, and sticks, I or also known as squaw wood on the website. I began building up, quite frankly, the log cabin. Um, this is a, this is an old stance, old Boy Scout standard, and uh, it, it's it's one that really allows you to get a lot of airflow, but it also creates a lot of hot coals real quick. And if you're not using it for wood uh, for your uh, Dutch oven, you can put your frying pan on there once it cools down a little bit, pretty well too. It makes a nice even bed, which is what you want. Um, you try and I mean, there's a lot of pine in this. But if you want, what you want to try and do is go with the hardwoods and the semi-hardwoods for the majority of what you're This here is a piece of birch, um, and uh, you want to look for something that looks like this. This stuff starts fires beautiful. Uh, it is in the fire starting area of uh, woodlandsurvival.com. You'll see that this is one of the recommended materials to use. And the way it works is, is that stuff, let me see if I can peel some of it here for you. Stuff peels right off like paper. And this is like liquid or this is like nature's um, fire starter or gasoline. I mean this stuff just burns. It'll burn wet and uh, it'll burn dry and it just it's wonderful. It starts, starts fires very well. And every time you're in the woods, don't peel it off the tree. But if you find a piece of stick like this that has it on there, collect up some of it. Because you can always carry it with you and you can always start a fire with this. Well, we're ready to cook. And so what we do is we have a nice little pile of coals here. And the feet. And it sits right down on top of it. And you notice that the feet keep it up off of the coals enough that it will, uh, you can actually start... It'll actually keep up the keep a lot enough airflow for the heat to go through, and uh, for the coals to continue to burn for a long period of time. Now, I'll walk up onto the porch again, and I will grab the lid. Say hello to. And we 
put our lid right there. And then we go into the fire here. We grab the equivalent, same amount of coals we used for the bottom on the top. Now, unlike using a set of uh, you know, some charcoal briquettes or whatever, you got to kind of eyeball this to get it to uh, to work right. Now, I'm not just cooking for this video. I'm cooking for the family as well. And so you'll probably be seeing a few of them walking in and out of the frame as we go. Don't mind them. They're just going about their camp tasks and things that they like to do while on vacation, like kayaking. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we'll catch you while the, when the food's cooked a little more. Hi, just wanted to uh, make one point. We got a little bit of wind coming up here and wind can really reduce the, uh, the uh, increase the amount of cook time because what it does is it burns your coals real, real hot and then they powder out real quick. So what you want to do is you want if you, if you have a little bit of wind, sometimes making yourself a little bit of a wind break with some of your extra wood will help your, your, your Dutch oven continue to get war, uh, to stay warm. Um, sometimes air is good for a fire, but in this case you want those coals to sit there and smolder real hot. And uh, the next thing you want to think about is the quality of your wood. I mean, I said before that you want to have hardwood. But you want to split it out real nice so that when it what it does is it will you'll get nice small enough coals that can actually fit on top of there. They're not big chunks like that big chunk right there, which tend to burn out. Now the way I do it, I'm gonna get me a ton here quick. Is I take and I'll split my wood with the anaconda or any other tool I happen to have available. little shivers like this they're really dry and they will burn very uh, they'll turn into coals very quickly do it again hope I don't chop my fingers off on camera that's nice so now these are ready to go into the fire fortunately eventually I'm gonna lose my baton but another thing that's kind of handy I wanted to cover these a little while ago. When the powder, when the coals do become powdery, and you, what you're going to want to do is you want to get the ash out of there. You do take the ash out. You just just brush the ash off to the side, like so that all you've got is the nice hard hot coals. It also helps you to move the coals around a little bit, like so. We're about due for new coals. Let's put some more coals on, shall we? All right, put some coals on the top. Next time we'll be putting coals on the bottom. We got plenty of heat coming out of the bottom right now, so as you can see, we already have lots of ash. The problem with ash is that it insulates the coals from the rest of the pot. And that makes it so that they don't heat your pot the way you want it to. So your hot pot's gonna it needs to have these coals to be pretty well standing out standing alone. And it's easier when you're dealing with charcoal briquettes than with this, but an earnest effort needs to be made to ensure that your pot is clear of the most of the worst of the Hi, this is Ridge Runner. Um, looks like the food's done. We're gonna bring it up and uh, we're gonna eat it. Let's take a look, see inside here. Nice thing about this trivet thing is when you lift it up and you take the pot lid off, you put it on the trivet so it doesn't go on the uh, go on the ground and put your food all in it. 
let's take a look at this meat here. Mmm, that looks like it's good. Doesn't that look good? Mmm, all right. And the potatoes, just right. Take a look at this carrot. Mm. Honey, you like to try a carrot? Mmm. Hot. Very hot. Very good, though. Mmm. All right. Now, put this back on. The other nice thing about a whisk broom. Whisk all this extra coals off. You don't want to take this up into the cabin or over to where your picnic table is or whatever. I think, I mean, it's safe to say a Dutch oven is not a lightweight option. And, uh, it's not something you're going to take on a backpacking trip, but on a truck camping trip or at a base camp for a hunting trip. Dutch oven is probably one of the most useful tools you can have. In a disaster preparedness scenario, it allows you, during fairly good weather anyway, to be able to cook just about anything you can cook in a regular, uh, on a regular stove. You can probably cook it a little better. So, uh, for me... I find that the Dutch oven is probably one of the more important tools you can have in your outdoor cooking repertoire and in your disaster preparedness equipment. Right. Let's bring this over to the table. And this is the result. Nice, pink, tasty meat. Enjoy, folks. Not pink enough.